Welcome to Vicious Whispers with Mark Tullius, your source for horror, sci-fi, suspense, and all things violent. Thank you so much for joining me today on Vicious Whispers with Mark Tullius. At the end of the episode, I will play a short story from Somber Stroll. That's a short collection, five short stories. But last week, I believe we played Mutual Understanding. This week, we will go with Crossing the Line. That's probably my favorite story from this collection. Been a while since I've read them or seen them, but uh, yeah, I do like that one. So hopefully you guys will dig it too. I think it's been a while since we played it. It has been an interesting week. It's my first time being a homeschool teacher. My son, Jake, he's in sixth grade. So he just started sixth grade. Tuesday was the first day of homeschool. He's been doing a great job. It's been fun. Uh, yesterday we got to do PE together, which was cool. Oftentimes when we go in the pool, you know, he wants to do his own thing. But I was like, no, man, I said, I'm your teacher. This is what we're doing. We're doing a full, I set the timer, I think it was for 20 minutes. We did an, ac- an extra five minutes outside the pool. But in addition to swimming laps, treading water, doing a lot of shadow boxing and fighting and working on those kinds of skills. I was like, why not incorporate that? Like he's already doing jiu-jitsu. He's back in jiu-jitsu at uh, 10th Planet Whittier, which is awesome. For the kids' class, tomorrow we're going to do a class with Wes Levine, a co-author of Trying to Die in the Tournament of Mortem and Try Not to Die by Your Own Hand, one of the co-authors on that one. So tomorrow we'll be doing that as an exercise. We'll do jiu-jitsu with him, and then we will do a writing session. Well, I'll do a writing session with Wes, and then after that, I will do a writing session with Jake. Today, Jake and I did our first writing session on Try Not to Die, what we're calling right now, in a video game. Similar to trying to die in our cranium, I guess, a little bit, but this is this is more like a Jumanji type thing. We still we're at the very beginning of fleshing it out, but it was a fun little I mean in 30 minutes it's amazing what you can do, especially when you know I'm asking them the questions, telling them there's no right answer, just to bark it out. And you know, we have we we got a lot done. Tomorrow, when we go back over it, we'll go a little bit deeper. We'll see what we liked, what we didn't like. You know, he'll think about tonight just on his own. So really cool process. His other classes have been going great. He's a very good student. So I think it's going to be a cool setup. It's definitely taking up more of my time. Also had to start driving my daughter to school. She has zero period, which means that she has to be at school at 720, which means I no longer do jiu-jitsu in the morning which kind of blows, but I don't know. I figure, you know what, I could just supplement other types of exercise. I don't need to do jiu-jitsu. I enjoy jiu-jitsu. I want to continue to do it, but if I do it a little at a slower pace, if I'm just going in every so often, that's going to be okay. So not ideal, but kids come first. This is my job. This is my job as a stay-at-home father. All the writing and everything, that's part of my job as well, but the important part is the kids, the family. I still have been doing quite a lot on the writing side of things. I just got the first edit. Well, I did a third of Trying to Die in Our Cranium. I sent that to Damon Manx. Him and Mark are working on that. They'll return to me, go over the edits, and then we'll continue with the rest of it. I'm about to do Trying to Die Escaping the Cult with Angel Van Atta. I already have all my notes. I just need to input them all. It's going to be a lot of work. Just takes me a while to do that part of it. But first, I realized I need to do all my German books. So the last two or three days, I've been working on trying to die on slash tag. So I already got the completed copy before I went on vacation. But because I've been so busy, I didn't have time to format it to make sure all the links were right and do all that shit, do all the back matter. But I'm pretty happy with what I did. I just finished it today. I'll do the EPUB tonight, make sure that all the links are still working correctly. Lots of times after I've already done all the formatting in a Word doc, then I go to check in an EPUB. Sometimes some of the links are broken. So I have to make sure that those are all working. All the destinies link up. All the choices are correct. And then I will upload that. I should have the cover finished tonight too for the German version. So that'll be cool. The print version I will do tomorrow as well. And because I did, I took the time to fix up the back matter. So it looks so much better now have covers of all the books in there, have all the correct links. And so I think that's going to help a lot. And I, by doing it, spending all the time doing, trying to die on slash tag back matter. Now, all I simply do is copy it and then put it into the other eight books. So 
This is book number nine that's in German. I'm going to take a little break on doing any more until I start running some ads, start getting some traction in Germany. I have not been doing that. I've been so busy. I haven't been focusing on marketing at all because, like I said, I'm fucking slammed as far as trying not to die. I just added some more authors, unofficially added some new authors to the family, the Try Not to Die family, but I'm not even going to mention any of that yet until contracts are signed and we got all that worked out. But yeah, I'm a very, very busy man, but at least I'm doing stuff that I enjoy. Even all this formatting stuff, you know, is not what I want to do, but it's still kind of nice when I finish it. Like, okay, yeah, you know what? Before I couldn't do all that or it'd take me forever. But now that I'm sober, it is so much easier, so much faster. So I'm I'm enjoying it. It's uh, going well. So that part of it is cool. So yeah, tomorrow, maybe this weekend, maybe this weekend is when I'll do the ads. I'll do a Facebook ad. I'll do, you know, just aiming at Germany. And then I will go, I'll fix up some of the back matter of the English books, just clean it up a little bit. And then I'll do another advertising campaign through Facebook, probably something I haven't taken advantage of. I should, but I just, once again, you know, just so busy. I'd rather, I'd rather just make new books. It's so much more fun just creating instead of having to deal with all this other stuff, but it's all good. One of the things I have been doing when I'm in the hyperbaric chamber, I've been reading this week I've been reading, well, not this week, but two days. And I don't read much at a time because I'm also writing. So I'll take a little break. I'll read a short story. I've read the first two and we've already gone too far by MJ Mars. Love it. So I was very, very pleased, especially because the first story in here is first person. Lots of times I'm discovering that people that can write incredibly well in third person it just doesn't translate to first person. It's definitely its own little beast, you know, or there's certain things that I just look for in first person and MJ did it all. So I know her trying to die in the UK is going to be amazing. I'm looking forward to reading the rest of these stories are nice little rewards for me. Yeah, not a lot of time to get as much reading done as I would like, but, you know, we're going constantly all day long. I need to give myself some breaks. Been a little bit more stressed by the end of the day, you know, with having a do the homeschool with the driving, dealing with some super rude ass parents again. I totally forgot about that. Just selfish motherfuckers that don't care. So just letting all that go. Yeah, I'll talk about that some more in therapy on Monday. Yeah. So all that stuff, cooking dinner, cooking meals. Yeah. And just being busy, not being able to do everything that I want to do. A little bit more stressed. Uh, I realized that yesterday by the end of the night, I was pretty much done. I was grouchy. I didn't want to be around anyone. So instead of just getting more upset and, and trying to bury it, I went into the hyperbaric chamber and then did some reading, did a little bit of writing and felt a lot better when I got out of there. So that is something I need to do. I need to get back in the sauna. And again, I need to remember also, you know, the pool workout with my son, that was cool, but it was only 25 minutes. I didn't do any other jujitsu this week. I didn't do a lot of other activity. So that's an important thing for me to remember. I do need to remain active. I need to get all that aggression or whatever else out so I can just be this happy, loving self that I generally am, that I want to be. So that's what this week was like. One of the days I took off, I think it was on Monday, my buddy Anthony came down with his son. Jake was able to hang out with us, play with his son. His son's only two, awesome little kid. They weren't here that long, but it was good time hanging out and you know realizing like okay yeah work isn't that important it's not the end all i could have spent the whole day the plan was to spend all day on monday before school started just knocking out as much work as i could but then i was like well i'm my own boss why am i such a dick to myself you know it's that conversation that i have it's like why there's there's really no rush on anything if i put out a book a month later than i had anticipated if i really want to is not a big deal. That's just something I need to keep in mind. But yeah, I think we're going to keep this short. I wasn't sure whether or not I was even going to record something, but I figured I'll do a quick little one. The main part of it is to get this short story out there, something for you guys to enjoy. And then just a little heads up on where I'm at. I haven't been doing much on social media. Again, busy, not really feeling it. I'm going to call this early. I still got to cook dinner tonight, write a newsletter, get that out for the morning. And yeah, wake up early, take my daughter to school, 
go train a little bit. So I need to have that newsletter done before all that happens. So I get it to you guys at a decent time. Thank you again for everyone that does subscribe to the newsletter. That is huge for everyone that subscribes to the podcast. And that's awesome. I do appreciate it. I appreciate you guys listening, putting up with me, even when I'm a grouchy old man. But uh, yeah, next week I promise I, well, I'm not going to promise I'm going to be in a better mood. I believe I'll be in a better mood just because, you know, getting used to the new schedule, I'll figure out a way to get in some jujitsu. All that stuff is going to help. I'll be done with these German books. That's going to be awesome as well. I'll have started my German campaign. That will be awesome as well. So all kinds of positive stuff. And that's what it is. So I can't expect everything to be positive all the time. There's going to be negatives. I'm going to get upset. I'm going to have difficulties, but I will pick myself up and just keep going and being as positive as possible for myself, for my family, for you guys, and for my co-authors. So that's what we are going to do. All right, let's go out on this story. This is from Somber Stroll, Crossing the Line. I hope you guys dig it, and I will talk to you next week. Peace. Crossing the Line There was nothing but sickness inside the ER, but it was too hot to wait outside for my ride. I grabbed a chair in the corner by the window, propped my elbow on the armrest and my throbbing hand against my chest. The aspirin had dulled some of the burning, but a raging headache made it difficult to keep my eyes open. When Gabe finally pulled up outside, I was a little more than irritated. The wooziness was still there when I walked to his truck, and it took me a bit to get in and do everything with my left hand. All I said was, they had me stitched up an hour ago. Gabe whipped a left out of the parking lot, stomped on the gas. You know how it is, I had to finish all the toe kicks before coming to get you. Well, what's the rush? The Johnsons aren't getting back till Tuesday. Gabe shrugged, kept his eyes on the road. Look, I just do what I'm told. I got here as fast as I could. I didn't care much for the way Gabe was acting. Like he'd forgotten I was the one who'd brought him into the business and taught him everything he knew. But I let it slide. It was a good thing to have hard-working employees. I thanked him for picking me up. Not a problem. So what'd the doctor say? Told me to get some better gloves and to start wearing a hard hat. Fucking know-it-all. Gabe took a left on 7th. How bad are your injuries? I pulled down the sun visor and checked my bandages in the mirror. Said my head's fine, that I was lucky the flat side of the 2 by 4 caught me. Probably have a headache for a day or two, though. What about your hand? You gonna be able to work? I held it so he could see the ball of white gauze wrapped around it. Just a little scratch. Yeah, right. I saw that blood. It was only seven stitches. You gonna be able to hold anything? Careful not to touch the gauze, I drew a line from the middle of my palm to the bottom of my thumb. Got the meaty part, but the cut wasn't deep. That's good. The Puerto Rican nurse didn't think so. She kept making the sign of the cross and saying, I cut right through my love line. That's not where your love line is. Gabe turned right on Cherry, then pointed toward the top of his palm. That's up here. She must have meant your lifeline. Everything was kind of fuzzy when she was talking, and to tell you the truth, I couldn't take my eyes off her tits. Man, you should have seen those knockers. Gabe didn't even crack his smile. I was busy working, remember? So what's going on with you? We were behind schedule before you got hurt, and now i got to work Saturday and Sunday for sure. You think I wanted to get hurt? I almost cut off my goddamn hand. I think you could have watched where you set up. You should have realized those beams weren't secure. I couldn't remember much about that morning, but I doubted I'd set up somewhere unsafe. I also couldn't remember when Gabe, or any other employee, had talked to me with such disrespect. I don't know what's going on with you, Gabe, but you better relax. If you need some time off, I'll bring someone on that won't bitch about it. Maybe Brad's got some buddies that'll be interested. You feeling okay? Maybe you got hit harder than you thought. Gabe slowed the truck and looked at me. I'm fine. We parked across the street from the Johnsons, 
Gabe cut the ignition and said, Well, since you brought it up, you should know Brad's not too happy about this. Don't say nothing, but he's pretty pissed. That I got hurt? Are you kidding me? Brad? Look, man, I'm not trying to be a dick or nothing, but you gotta see it like he does. You already missed half a day, and who knows how much more you'll be out, not to mention the increase in the workers' comp. Those were all things any boss would contemplate, but Brad wasn't the goddamn boss. I jumped out of the truck and headed straight for the garage. Brad stood next to the Johnson's BMW, flexing while holding his cell phone, acting like he wasn't. Halfway there, I had to slow down, my balance all screwed up. The dizziness cleared with some deep breathing, and I continued until I was a few feet from Brad. Brad kept chit-chatting, acted like he didn't notice me standing there. I wasn't about to keep waiting like a fool, so I interrupted him mid-sentence. Brad. He motioned to his phone, kept on talking, raised his eyebrows as if to say I was retarded for not seeing he was busy. I said, get off the goddamn phone. Brad ended his call. His cheeks were red, but he kept his voice low. Are you serious? I wanted so bad to punch him square in the nose, but didn't trust my ability using my left. Are you kidding me? Brad shoved the phone into his pocket, puffed out his chest. What's your problem, Andy? Who the hell you think you're talking to? A scrawny little punk that's in serious need of an ass-kicking. Brad's eyes got big. Who put you in charge? When I'm off-site, Jonesy takes lead. And if he's not around, it goes to Gabe. You got that? Brad laughed, hard and long, sounding like a goddamn hyena. Jesus, Andy, you need to go home or go back to the hospital. I don't think that doctor should have released you. I don't give two shits what you think. Who the hell do you think you are? Your boss, Brad said, real serious. Now turn around, get in your car, and go home. You're lucky I don't fire you. My boss? This is some kind of joke, right? Where the hell are the cameras? I don't have time for this. Get out of here before I throw you out. Any other day, I would have picked up a hammer and told him to give it his best shot. But right then, I was having a hard time even keeping my feet. I'd deal with him later. The prick couldn't just let me walk away. Loud enough for everyone to hear, Brad said, And don't come back until you've got your head straight. Sorry, but we don't need any psychos on the site. It took everything I had not to turn around, but I kept walking until I was standing at my fire engine red F-350. When the door didn't open, I pulled out my keys and hit the unlock button. The door still wouldn't open, so I pressed the lock button to see if my remote was working. My truck didn't chime, but the primered El Camino across the street beeped. I've never seen that car before, but I figured one of my employees must have switched keys with me as some kind of a joke. I wasn't going to give them the show. As cool as I could, I walked over and glanced at the driver's side window, but I couldn't see past the thick coating of dust. When I started to get in, I noticed the sign in the back of my truck. Someone had scraped off the Andy's Carpentry Express logo and replaced it with one that read, Cabinets by Brad. They even put Brad's cell number down as the contact. I wanted to fire everyone but that wouldn't have been fair. No way would my whole crew have been involved. I was too well respected for that shit. I got in the car, hoping to narrow down who was behind the childish prank. Whoever was doing it was a smoker, something I wouldn't tolerate on a job site and could barely handle anywhere else. Cigarette butts filled the ashtray. Disney stickers plastered the peeling dashboard, and inside the cup holder were a dozen pennies, submerged in a half inch of soda. Careful not to touch anything, I leaned across the seat and popped open the glove box. A handful of hot sauce packets, a stack of napkins, several crumpled and stained, tumbled out. It took some digging before I found the registration. I scratched off the hardened ketchup on the front of the slip. The yellowed piece of paper said I was the owner. This was no forgery like I'd ever seen. 
Either someone had gone way out of their way to screw with me, or I was losing it. There was no question I shouldn't be driving, but I needed to get home. I double-checked the registration to make certain the address in my head matched up with reality. The car started on the third try. The sun shining through the grimy windshield made my stomach flip, and I barely held on to my breakfast. I squinted my eyes and focused on Tanya. She had a bit of a temper and would be pissed at me for getting hurt, but she was a good woman. She'd take care of me and help sort things out, bring Sammy home from school. One of her 30 seconds hugs, exactly what I needed. There was a shiny Nissan Frontier in the driveway, so I parked on the street. I wondered how in the hell I got talked into buying on American, and why wasn't there a booster seat in the back? A wave of paranoia washed over me at the front door. The key fit perfectly, but I was afraid to turn it. I pulled it together and went inside, leaned against the living room wall, no longer sure of anything. Had Tanya rearranged things or had it always been like this? What about the scattered toys I didn't remember buying and the missing big screen TV? A loud grunt came from the hallway. Maybe Tanya moving stuff in the bedroom. I pushed open the last door on the left. The woman on my bed was too thin to be Tanya. The dirty blonde was spread-eagled, holding her feet above her head like a malnourished infant discovering her toes. I didn't recognize the guy between her legs, but whoever it was, neither of them had business in my bedroom. Holding onto the doorframe with my good hand for support, I said, What the hell are you guys doing? The woman screamed and bucked the guy off. He hit the floor, scooped up his jeans, and dove out the window. She scrunched into a ball against the headboard and kept yelling. My head felt like it was going to burst. I said, Calm down. She peeked over her forearm, her sea-green eyes unmistakable. What are you doing here? I hadn't seen her since high school. My very first girlfriend. Karen? The truck screeched out of the driveway and screamed down the street. Karen sat up, everything exposed. Why are you home so early? I pointed at my head, didn't think I could speak. Jesus Christ, Andy. Karen grabbed a hot pink waitress uniform off the Ikea nightstand. You're not even mad. You don't even care. I reached out for the dresser and steadied myself. Why are you here? Karen slid off the bed and onto the dirty yellow carpet I remembered as impeccably white shag. She stormed into the bathroom. You're such a spineless shit! I should have told Todd he could stay! The door slammed shut. Karen said some more things that don't need repeating. There were pictures over the dresser. Three, just like always. But these ones were different. The five by seven to the left was me and Karen at the prom we never went to. She'd been doing things she shouldn't have, so I called it off the week before. The largest was an eight by ten of the diner's Christmas party. Karen with a Santa hat and rosy cheeks, the cook's big smiling face behind her shoulder, his hand planted right on her ass. There were four kids in the five by seven to the right. The oldest boy looked about twelve, and he was way too cute to be mine. The twins sitting in front of him were about eight or nine, my lump of a nose on both of them. By their feet was a baby girl. It was Sammy, but with brown hair and dull eyes. Not my Sammy. Over in the bathroom, Karen kept yelling. I was a coward. I was a pussy. She needed a real man. That's when I knew this was no joke. I knew that for sure just like I knew it couldn't be real. In front of the 8x10 was a pack of Marlboros and a lighter. I grabbed them both and sat on the bed, did my best to block Karen out. The cigarette tasted like shit, but I still lit it and pulled long and hard. I held the smoke for five seconds, blew it out like an old pro, put out the cigarette on the sheets Karen just fucked on. I waited to see if it caught fire but not because I cared. Whether or not I was crazy, this was my life. It didn't matter if it had always been this way or if it had just changed today. The sick feeling in my gut told me all that mattered was I was stuck with it. The lighter slipped from between my fingers, but I was fast, caught it with my right hand, a blast of pain making me yelp like a little girl. 
I dropped the lighter and watched the bandages go from white to red, a thin line spreading across the meaty part of my palm. Across the lifeline the nurse kept harping on. I pulled out my pocket knife, sliced off the bandages. Three of the stitches had come undone, the blood oozing out of the small slit. I pursed my lips and ground my teeth. I put the blade under the first stitch and snapped it. I did the next three real quick to get it over with. Blood flowed from the wound, but I barely felt it. My mind was racing, trying to figure out what I should do. Karen called my name. When I didn't answer, she said it again. All the anger gone. I know you're still in there. My palm. That stupid little line that had been cut in half. I couldn't undo the cut, but I could make a new one. From the bathroom, Karen said, Todd means nothing to me. I love you. You know that. You have to. The blade plunged into the intersection of wound and lifeline. With a quarter inch of the blade beneath my skin, I dug the knife straight to the bottom of my middle finger I was pointing toward the bathroom door. Karen kept trying. Can you forgive me, baby? I dropped the knife on the deep red carpet that grew darker as the blood poured from my wound. The bathroom door opened. It wasn't Karen. It was someone else I hadn't seen in a long time. The person whose name was never spoken in this house. Ever. Not since the fight she had with her big sister, Tanya. I covered the knife with my boot, hid my hand against my thigh. Lisa was dressed like a lawyer, her dark brown hair up in a tight bun. She was as beautiful as I remembered, so smart and sophisticated in her glasses. She took one look at my head and asked, What's happened to you? She wasn't acting like it had been twelve years since I'd seen her. The time I pulled her off Tanya, but not before Lisa had left her mark. I couldn't imagine any reality where Lisa would be let in our house, I asked. Where's Tanya? Lisa stopped four feet away. Why would you ask that? My hand was leaking all over the satin sheets. I grabbed the bandage, held it as tight as I could. I'm not feeling very good. Lisa's voice went soft, just like it had been when she tried to convince me I deserved better than Tanya. She sat beside me, brought the sweetest breeze. It was hard to talk with my hand on fire, but I tried to explain. M mild concussion. Just not feeling myself today. Lisa put her hand on my neck, gave the lightest squeeze. You gonna be okay? You want me to kiss it? I'd had a crush on Lisa before I even met Tanya. It was hard not to say yes to that voice, that smell, that body. I hadn't said a word, but Lisa kissed me anyway, her dark red lips so soft on my cheek. She got up and offered her hands. Come on, baby. I'll make everything better. Too weak to resist, I got up with her holding my left hand, my right behind my back. Her arms wrapped around me, made me feel safe. You've got to be more careful out there. Gabe sounded pretty concerned. The dresser stood in front of me, the three picture frames right where they'd always been. A yellow lab in the first one, a blue bandana around his neck, his hair just combed. The other five by seven had been taken in the same studio, me in a turtleneck, Lisa in a cashmere sweater, both of us smiling. Lisa slid one hand around to my front. What's wrong, baby? The eight by ten was of our wedding up on a cliff overlooking the ocean. Lisa nuzzled into my neck and undid my belt buckle. That's better, she said. Relax. I wasn't relaxed. I was looking around the room. Not at the vases, the paintings, the rugs. I was searching for another picture. One with Sammy. Lisa pulled down my zipper. I took a step back. Her thin little hips and flat stomach told me everything I needed to know. But I asked anyway. We... We have any kids? 
Lisa sounded worried. You better sit down. I said, no kids, no Sammy. She was staring at the bloody knife, the puddle around it. Andy, you're scaring me. Let's get you to the hospital. I snatched up the knife and brought my mangled hand onto my lap, the bandage so heavy with blood. Lisa gasped. What are you doing? I said, it's not you. She screamed. Put it down! The blade hit bone. Almost made me pass out. I drug the knife through my flesh and fell to the floor. My knees a loud bang on the hardwood. A woman shouted, Jesus Christ, Andy, what are you doing? I looked up and saw Tanya. Despite all the pain, I'd never been so happy. Tanya ripped the sheet from the bed and wrapped my hand. She took the knife away and said, Are you crazy? I lost you. I lost you and Sammy. She kept pressure on my hand and pulled me to my feet. Well, I'm here now, she said, but we've got to get you to the hospital. Fine, but not the one on Main. She pulled me toward the hallway. We'll go to the closest one. You've lost a lot of blood. Is Sammy okay? Tanya turned toward me and said, Of course she is. I hadn't noticed it before, but the scar above Tanya's right eye was no longer just a scar. The whole area was depressed. That eye was made of glass. Tanya turned my chin to the side. What's that? I could barely think straight. I had no idea what she meant. I wanted to ask what happened to her face. If I hadn't been there to break up the fight, if I'd been too slow to get the rock away from Lisa. That's not my shade. I wiped at my cheek. Got blood everywhere. I didn't kiss you today. My hand. It's my hand. Her good eye glared. The knife clenched in her fist. Who was it? I took a step back and said, You don't understand. The blade was only four inches, but pointed at my heart. Who was it? Lisa kissed me, but Tanya pushed me onto the bed, leapt at me with the knife. My right hand was useless. With my left, I grabbed hold of her wrist, the blade trembling just inches from my chest. I shouted, You weren't here! Tanya raked her nails across my face, tried to gouge out my eye. I rolled us over so I was on top of her, but I lost the knife in the scuffle. I used my knees to pin down her left hand and her right. The knife was not in either. Her wheeze made me look up. The knife lodged in her throat. I tried to save her, but it was no use. First time Tanya ever gave up without a fight. I propped myself up, so I only see Tanya and the pictures. The pictures keep changing with each pass of the blade. But Tanya never moves. <laughs>